if you have a 50 qubit quantum computer, then you can do something uh, as fast as it would or, uh, you know, take an ordinary computer. The time it would take is the age of the universe. If we were talking about a power that's already, uh, you know, challenging everything that we understand of being human, the next session challenges something possibly even more fundamental, which is our entire notion of reality, you know, and uh, that is quantum physics. How many of us are thinking about quantum mechanics, quantum computing, qu quantum communication? Very few of us. I would ask you again to raise your hands. How many of you are familiar with quantum physics? Only Chennai could have 10 hands, you know, on an evening on Wednesday. But here is again a nascent industry, a nascent, uh, uh, you know, applications of this, which we're not thinking about, but where there's already a global race, an arms race, to get dominance in this field. Of course, it's only US and China that are dominating that field, but recently, um, uh, Prime Minister Modi announced a national quantum mission and devoted 6,000 crores to that uh, field. This year, the Nobel Prize in Physics went to uh, Anthony Zeilinger, who's a quantum uh, physicist. And, you know, that brings us very close to the beginnings of why we should be debating and discussing and at least getting familiar with this topic. And to unravel, as I said, all of that for us, we have someone fantastic who herself is in the news because she conducted an experiment which, as I said, questions the fundamental notions of our reality. It also put us somewhere on the map, an experiment that almost equals what uh, Anthony won the, Zalinga won the Nobel for. I'm going to ask her to help us, uh, you know, understand and decode all that. But I just wanted to again share just one or two facts, which is that this is a, f uh, a field, a nascent field, where we were talking about AI and what AI can do so fast and what AI can do so exhaustively. But here comes a new technology which can do all of this 185 million times faster than the supercomputers that already exist. How can we not engage with it, you know? the existing commercial computers, which are like below the level of infancy. Just today, if you look up Google, China spoke about a new computer which has done in one minute, less than one minute, two lakh computations, which it would take a supercomputer to take five years to do. And that's this technology at its infancy. So this is why we thought that at its very inception, Ignition is a great platform to be thinking about this and talking about it. And to do all of that, I would like to invite on stage Urvashi Sinha, who is a lead quantum researcher in India. As I said, she's just, her and her team at the Raman Institute, uh, Research Institute, have done an experiment that has got global attention and which, as the headline said, questions Einstein, actually not questions, disproves Einstein's theory of relativity. That's how important she is. And of the many awards, many committees, many important academic uh, positions that she holds, here's just one indication of you know, how pivotal and catalytic she is, is that she won the Chandrasekharan um, uh, Saraswati Award, which has been given to prime ministers and presidents and Lata Mangeshkar and uh, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Wajpayee and uh, you know, President uh, Abdul Kalam Azad and innumerable others. But she is the youngest uh, to get it. When I was looking at that, everybody was 60 and above. You'll see she's nowhere close to that. And she's a woman scientist. And the only other young person in that gallery of fame was Maljur Bhargav, who was anywhere close to her age. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Urvishi Sinha. Thanks a lot. That was a very overwhelming introduction. <laughs> we are overwhelmed with the knowledge you guys are brokering into, the universe, into our universe, not the universe. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much. So, you know, Rishi, like I asked um, 
uh, Karthik, that at the beginning, before we even try to begin to decode all the debates going on around this, mm -hmm. please help our audience and me understand the realm of quantum mechanics and quantum physics. Mm -hmm. Why is it deemed almost a realm of fiction? You know, why is it called weird? Even physicists constantly describe it as weird. Mm -hmm. And yet, wh what makes it so powerful that there's a global arms race going on to try and harness it? Yeah, thanks, Shoma. So, I mean, you know, I was... I was thinking you would ask such a question. So we have spent several years in trying to understand quantum physics. So two minutes of quantum crash course is a very difficult thing to do. So what I would say is that, you know, quantum is something which, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an area of physics which becomes relevant when the size of a particle becomes very small, okay? So you, me, everyone in this room, we are all governed by laws of quantum physics. But then we don't really see it manifest in what we do because we are very, uh, you know, large in some sense. So when something becomes very small, like an electron, you know, small particles, a small particle of light, photon, that is when quantum physics becomes important. And so just to give you an example of, you know, what would happen when things become quantum, uh, something which is called tunneling, okay? An example I always like to take. So an electron, you know, when it is moving very fast, it reaches a barrier, it doesn't stop there is a finite possibility that it actually crosses through that barrier, which is very, very high. Harry Potter-like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly the, uh, you know, the nine and three quarters. You know, the platform nine and three quarters is much motivated by this tunneling phenomenon. But Harry Potter does it in reality. But if you and I were to, I mean, I've tried this actually, go and hit myself against the wall, I've always come back very disappointed. <laughs> and, and, and my, you know, child who's right here, you know, she was also, in, you know, encouraged to do this when she was small. Now she doesn't do it anymore. And it never works, right? So You that, have a blue forehead, <laughs> Raika. <laughs> yeah, Raika is, uh, you know, very intelligent now. So these are the kind of things, you know, which, uh, of course, we could also be affected by. It doesn't happen because we are very large. And so these, these sort of counterintuitive, I don't call it weird because, you know, that's my job. So I don't have a weird job, you know, so uh, it's counterintuitive. So these, these are the kind of things which make quantum physics uh, different. But Urvishi, let me push you to uh, make it a little bit even more simpler than that. Yeah, that yeah. at its heart, mm. if I understand it correctly, and mm. I'm, I'm playing the interlocutor here because I'm at sub-zero knowledge, so maybe that will help <laughs> others understand it, yeah. is that... Typically, all things that we, in classical physics, yeah. everything has fixed properties. Right. But the heart of quantum physics is that particles have no fixed properties. Absolutely. Till yeah. you actually see it or Til measure it. Till you actually it. see it or measure it. And so this is something which is very counterintuitive. So, I mean, you know, uh, our previous speaker is sitting here and, you know, he's sort of looking at us right now. And I look at my family. My expectation is he's still looking at us. So this is the kind of thing we are used to, that our property, you know, the fact that you are sitting there, you are sitting there, I'm sitting here. These are things which are independent of whether this audience is even listening to us or not. But if you think about a quantum particle, it does not have any fixed property unless you measure it. So it can have, you know, a plethora of properties. And only when you measure, it reveals what it wants to reveal. And so it's fundamentally different, let's say, from uh, our, uh, you know, uh, classical reality. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, again, I'm going to share with the audience that at the heart of this, it's like Einstein said, because he was being challenged, he said, I would really like to think that the moon exists whether we see it or not. But, Absolutely. <laughs> but, yeah. but quantum physics challenges that notion that does anything exist unless we see it? Uh, Urvishi has refused to let me go down that path, but Vedantic thought says that, that this is all Maya and this is illusion. Yeah. Yes. I won't take you there so fast. But <laughs> just help us understand three basic things about quantum, mm -hmm. which will help us understand why China, America, and now India are trying mm -hmm. to get on top of it, which is that what makes a quantum co computer faster than the supercomputer? Right. Why can it do it 185 million times faster than a supercomputer? Yeah, yeah. So now, of course, I just, you know, because I'm actually a, you know, practicing quantum physicist, I just want to say that, you know, a quantum computer does not make everything 185 million times faster. So, you know, there are a specific class of problems where this works. So just, you know, my disclaimers will be there as we go on, you know, because I actually make these things in the lab. So I'm an experimental physicist. So the, the basic idea which makes this quantum computer work is what is called the principle of superposition. Okay, so what is superposition? It, it's, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, so, you know, the fact that some of you are smiling at me, some of you are not following what I'm saying already, uh, <laughs> but then some of you are following a little bit and 
not following a little bit. So, you know, this thing that, you know, you can be a little bit of this and a little bit of that, that is what is called superposition. It's essentially the English word, that we are, you know, a mix of various possibilities. And so this is what happens in a quantum particle, uh, like a light switch, you know, it can be on and off at the same time, okay? And so this superposition gives us this, you know, uh, possibility of this particle being in, let's say, even infinite number of uh, properties can exist simultaneously. So this simultaneous existence of infinite probabilities gives rise to this very fast, uh, you know, computing because it can make use of one of many instead of just one fixed, uh, you know, outcome. Uh, outcome. Yeah. So this is the principle which makes the quantum computer that fast. Yeah. Um, are you are you with Rishi on this? Do you understand what she's talking about, or have we? I like she said. Are you smiling because? Not really. <laughs> okay. So I'm. I Rishi, I'm going to be a, your translator. If Absolutely. I, if yeah. I may. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were talking about the computers being this fast because at least we know that a computer operates in a binary of zero and one, but the qubits, which is the fundamental, uh, you know, unit of quantum physics can be as a zero and a one at the same time. Uh, Absolutely, so it's a little bit of zero and a little bit of one. So that's why it can do every, every infinite possibility, it can very quickly uh, analyze all of that and give you all the possibilities, which uh, like th think of it as a old uh, cow, a, a horse cart in comparison to a Ford motor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just in terms of speed. Sure, 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 yeah, I mean it, it is just, uh, to just to give you an example, if you have a 50 qubit quantum computer, then you can do something uh, f as fast as it would, or, uh, you know, take an ordinary computer, the time it would take is the age of the universe. So in some sense, you cannot uh, even conceive of doing that, right. using even all the classical computers taken together. So that is what we are talking about for a certain class of problems. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, let's bring it down to the here and now. There's yeah. a race between all these governments uh, yeah. and ours now mm. to harness this because in the area of communication mm. and cryptography and security, mm. this is a very, very powerful uh, Absolutely. force. Yeah. Uh, you know, the moment that somebody really cracks the qu quantum computer, nothing, no information in this world is going to be safe because that quantum computer can crack anything in the world. So you did an experiment mm -hmm. that is going to help, uh, you know, create secure communication Absolutely, for India. Yeah. So can yeah, you yeah, talk yeah. about that in so the simplest is, terms? Yeah, this is actually our main, uh, you know, area of uh, interest. So what happens is, so when you have, so I mean, you know, I see a uh, lady in front, uh, she's using a cell phone. So one of the things we are doing using a cell phone is we are doing, uh, you know, buying things online, Amazon, Flipkart, we are always buying things. We are uh, you know, we are, we are sharing our banking information with a third party. So now the point is that, you know, if you're doing this, uh, currently what we're doing, you know, we are assuming that the information I'm giving is actually only taken by the intended uh, th second party. So, but suppose you get hold of this information and you are malicious, then of course my bank account is, uh, you know, gets down to zero. So that is uh, something we don't want. So now, how are we doing this? Of course, we still have some security. What we are currently doing is we are using, basing the security on certain problems being very hard. Okay, and so this hardness of a problem is very subjective. So something that is hard for you may not be very hard for a very, very efficient computer. And a quantum computer can actually break this security. So this is proven that we can run algorithms which will break the security. And quantum computers are becoming very real. So what we are doing now as a community is we are coming up with a you know, method of doing this security, banking, transaction, voting, all these strategic uh, you know, examples. We are doing this by using quantum physics itself. So if you have a quantum threat, you have a quantum solution, and that is called quantum communication, okay? And so we are using laws of quantum physics now, so it's a paradigm shift in security. So we are, you know, getting rid of the current means, so the whole idea is that we will replace the entire security that we have globally with the quantum um, analog. And our lab is the first one to work on quantum security in India. And however, you know, if you and I are going to share some information using quantum security is not very interesting beyond a point. Yeah. We want our country to 
secretly, you know, be able to share something with a friendly country and, and, and you know, some other country which is malicious should not get hold of this information. So the distance is a very important problem here. How do you solve this distance problem? And what we are doing is we are using an out-of-the-box solution where we are using a satellite uh, to, you know, as a trusted uh, courier. So the satellite is interacting with me, satellite with interact with, uh, let's say, Canada, and India and Canada can share quantum security. Right. So this is the, uh, you know, big problem we are attacking. I, I just want to draw the audience a little bit back into this conversation because I'm getting this kind of vibration, you know, <laughs> that we've lost some of the audience. Sure. Is that when we are talking about the qubit, uh, you had a lovely analogy, you know, which is the typical, I don't know the, um, you know, the Tamil cinema equivalent, but in Bollywood, you always had that Ram and Sham, you know, the twins that got lost at birth and mm -hmm. could always feel each other no matter whether they'd met or not. So in, in uh, quantum physics, you have the quantum entanglement, right? Yeah. So can Quant you... Yeah, so quantum entanglement, the best way to explain is by this lost at Kummela example, you know, so that has come in lots of Bollywood films at least. And so the whole idea is that these twins, you know, even if one of them is lost and the other grows up somewhere, that's the usual example. They share this correlation because they, uh, they were born, you know, uh, almost Connected. simultaneously. And so this is what happens in quantum entanglement, that two particles, they are born not almost simultaneously, in this case simultaneously, and they share a correlation which they share even if they are separated by thousands of kilometers. And so quantum entanglement is used as a resource in quantum security as well as quantum computers, for instance. Yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm just trying to draw it back to uh, Urvishi's experiment that, you know, the Nobel winner who won that, uh, he proved without, it's called a loophole-free experiment, mm -hmm. that two particles in quantum entanglement, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, no, uh, right do actually have this quantum, this uh, Einstein called it spooky action at a distance, that you do something to Ram and Shyam at the other end of the galaxy is also going to immediately have the same reaction. Yeah. Am I right? And this happens in the movies also, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So you are uh, torturing one and the other is Feels feeling... the pain. So this was a Ranveer uh, Singh film, no? a very recent one called Circus. Right. Uh, which happened, uh, where it happened in a very dramatic way. He would feel the electric shocks. <laughs> Somebody else was getting the shock and he would feel the shock. So, right. so the, the, of course, it's a very popular uh, description, but that is what happens in quantum entanglement. Right. Yep. But your experiment then further went and proved that mm. even a particle in itself, in mm. its solo self, yeah. has quantumness. Absolutely. And I was reading all the articles, you know, around mm. praising your experiment, mm. and it said that it actually now completely questions the notion of reality. Absolutely. Because you can take this upwards mm. and there's no reason why it stops at atoms or further. And I read a phrase which literally said, this breaks the legs of the table and chair on which we are sitting. Which means that does this chair exist? Does this table exist? Does Shoma exist if you're not looking at me? Does, is my hair black if you're not looking at it and making it black? So it questions the whole notion of reality. Whole notion of reality. Yeah. So, that, now answer that, uh, Urbishi. Are, are we really sitting in an illusion right now? Uh, it depends on whether you're looking at the audience. <laughs> I mean, you know, okay. but then, yeah, I mean, you know, the one thing we have to realize is that we are not yet in the quantum domain. So, you know, we are very classical. So we're made up of these quantum particles. But the, together, we actually uh, still are classical. So, you know, uh, your hair will remain black. But then I think we have this beautiful discussion that, you know, it's because, uh, you know, it appears black to us. But what about bumblebees and things like that? So different animals may have different perceptions of what your hair color is. And so, again, that brings us to this macroscopic vision of reality that, you know, uh, it depends on the observer. So this is what quantum physics is all about. It's all an observer-dependent phenomenon. So it depends on, you know, what you are measuring, what you are observing, what property you see. And so what we went on to do is take this ex uh, experiment further. So Anton Zeilinger and other, you know, colleagues who won the Nobel Prize, they actually did this for two particles which were separated, like this Ram and Sham example that we took. But now the question is, why do we need to be twins in order to see whether we are real or not? Even a single particle we need to be able to do. So we, we did this experiment in the single particle domain. And, um, you know, we did it in a way that hasn't been possible in 40 years. So, in fact, we are very pleased with that, that, you know, we uh, were able to show uh, the lack of realism for a single particle. Please remember that quantum particles are not... Uh, uh, real, in the sense that, you know, uh, uh, the properties are only dependent on what you measure. So this yeah. is what we went on to show. I, 
I don't know, in, in, through this entire conversation, have we kind of communicated the heart of what we are talking about? How many of you would raise I your hand and say you're getting I hope all of you are confused it. because that would be the message here. Because, you know, it is very difficult to... I mean, I'm sincerely hoping that you didn't follow everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because because right. if that is true, then we are, you are with us. Because, you know, it's an entire field trauma. So. Right. No, but I, I, I was saying that at least if we communicate this fundamental thing, which is... I would say, like, yeah. I would want the takeaway from this session to be two. One is that why is, like I said, why is everyone harnessing this? Is the sheer power of this, you know, that just imagine that we're operating in one choice. Uh, the computers are operating on one highway, and here comes somebody that can quickly go zigzag zoom over all the possible highways and, and give and you an reach answer. the answer exponentially faster. faster. So this 187 million is an example, but the idea is that something which would take the age of the universe now takes seconds. And so there are, and so I just want to give you one or two examples of, you know, problems which actually are getting benefited from this. So as opposed to say AI, which is, you know, much more recent, let's say, you know, it was a beautiful topic, but quantum physics is more than 100 years old. And so your phone, or whether, you know, your MRI machine, or the fact that, you know, some of us get our eye uh, vision corrected using lasers. These are all because of quantum physics. So it's something that we are all using inadvertently. So just to, you know, sometimes the conversation leads to this thing that, you know, everything is very speculative, but it's actually very real. But having said that, now we talk about quantum computers, you know, and there is a question, are these real? Are they doing anything real? So one of the big things that a quantum computer can do is actually make new material okay and so give you an example one of the things which we are all worried about let's say as conscientious citizens is a clean environment okay so we all want uh, the environment to be clean because naturally we have contributed to polluting it so one is green energy that is okay but the other is you know you come up with a material which absorbs the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and just essentially cleans up the environment around you you don't have such a material but a quantum computer can help you build one and this is something which is already being uh, researched globally, you know, clean environment. The other is, you know, for instance, COVID. Something that, you know, now maybe hopefully some of you are following something, otherwise we are doing something completely wrong. But COVID is a situation we have all been through. And so India did beautifully in COVID. You know, we came up with the vaccines. All of us probably are vaccinated, but many countries didn't do it. Uh, because they couldn't, right? So the idea is that we want to reach, you know, want those vaccines to reach them. So what prevents us? Countries are not next to each other. Transportation. COVID vaccine has to be, you know, in a temperature, certain temperature. And they also expire. So many, many new, new, you know, uh, conditions are coming in, which prevent me from just sending the vaccine to the less fortunate country. So this is an optimization problem. And quantum computers can solve optimization problems way faster than the classical ones. So these are examples, you know, where quantum computers are already being used. So this is not a matter of fiction. Uh, and, and that is why we are entering this race, you know, because uh, we want to use it for social good. I'm actually involved in uh, using quantum computers for social good. I'm, I'm working on using it for the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, uh, working with a, a, you know, institute in Geneva for this. And so we are actually, you know, and, and, and of course you brought up the, he, he was the dooms, uh, you know. He, Doomsayer. Yeah. <laughs> so then I, 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 w I don't want to be that, but then any technology has a flip side. And so today I'm trying to make better, you know, environment or uh, give you a COVID vaccine faster. Somebody else will use it to crack my security and take all my, uh, you know, secrets away. So we need to, uh, you know, ensure that we have good governance for this. Right. And that is something we are working on. Yeah. So I just wanted our audience to understand that where are we at in yeah. this. Uh, you know, um, I was yeah. saying IBM just shared a, a post about the fact that they have a computer that has 400 Four, qubits. 430 odd. 430. So when we're talking about the qubits, just to help us get more fascinated by this conversation, here is a scientist that's dealing with a material that has to be operate, I mean, you have to deal with that yeah, material? The picture that you show is for a superconducting device. So it needs to be at a very, very low temperature for this to work. Minus yeah. 400? Is that... Or well, it's zero? micro Kelvin. Right. Yeah. 
so anyway, but India is now able to harness four or five qubits. Yeah. But America is already, IBM has a 400 qubit strong computer. And it said that in the next five years or seven years, it's going to get to 4,000 4, qubits. That's again that exponential uh, speed coming. You know, it's taken them that long. Mm -hmm. So help us understand, Urbishi, that mm -hmm. uh, India is at four qubits mm -hmm. and we're already saying like, Wow, you've done something now, fantastic. Now is my America. time to defend the country. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, what, what do you do when you're in a forum like this? At least you should go with the impression that we are actually doing very well. So uh, IBM has worked on this for two and a half decades. And they have been resourced very, very heavily. Now we have a national quantum mission with a certain amount of resource. China has spent billions of dollars on it over the last few decades. So, you know, at some point we need to realize these things take resources. We have produced the four or five that we have with what we had. But now with this pumping in of some resource and hopefully others also pitch in, we need philanthropy. You know, our philanthropists just go and, you know, do brain research and cancer research. But this is actually equally important because it will help the brain research and cancer research. We can come up with new drugs. I mean, drugs for good causes. I mean, of course, <laughs> so, you know, just because, you know, I don't want to be quoted in mean, new drugs. Yeah. So, uh, so new medicines, right? So we are, uh, you know, at a very, very important stage where we have a, a, a critical, you know, number of people who are working on all these technologies, who are looking at this national mission as something which will catapult us to, you know, the uh, higher number, because this number is not just about adding you know, just to make right. it clear that it, it is about actually uh, changing the whole structure. Right. And so we want to go to, you know, for our, from my thing, I want a global quantum communication network. So the entire world should be connected using quantum security. And so this is a tall, you know, ask. Yeah. It requires resources. Right. And now we can hope to go there, right? So right. we are doing very well with what we had and with very little support. Yeah. No, again, I mean, just to bring the geopolitical angle, like China has a 2,300 kilometer quantum link. secure yeah. link already, you know, and mm -hmm. we're at like harnessing four qubits. And again, I want to play her ambassador for her, her mm -hmm. their, their field of knowledge is that the qubits, I mean, these particles that we are talking about, for them to exist in these infinite possibilities, they have to exist in a way where they don't get measured, you know, because the moment there's any intervention, you measure it, it becomes something uh, like, you know, it becomes something you can define, and so it loses its quantum power. So this is a constant riddle that they are chasing, you know, that how do you harness this? Because any noise, as they call it, any, even an inkling that it is an experiment, it is going to get measured, makes it lose its mysterious quality, you know? So one, you have to do it in that level of cold, then you have to not let it know that it's getting harnessed. So there's some really fascinating, so mysterious just aspects. To, just to, to add to this, you know, you need to be able to access it, but then you need to be able to do it in a way that it doesn't lose its quantum property. So it's like, you know, a constant tussle, because if you do this a little too much, then you lose its quantumness. And if you lose its quantumness, then there's no point in accessing it. So there are all these criteria which need to be simultaneously satisfied. So it's not, right. I mean, it's not trivial. I mean, you know, so that I don't want to <laughs> so I, I to want, you how to do it. I want yeah. to take us to a little more pop, uh, popular culture. Excellent. That's my, my <laughs> right. thing. So yeah. we've been showing this cat right through. Of course, it's I, 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 I have been looking at it, yes. So it's Schrodinger's cat, which again kind of helped sum this up. Famously, Schrodinger's cat could be dead or alive till you open it and you decide. Then it takes on whether it's dead or it's alive. So it was there in the Big Bang Theory, right? I don't know whether the audience is familiar with this sitcom called Big Bang Theory. Half an episode was there on Schrodinger's cat. So we have made it to right. pop culture, not me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you that, you know, we're, we're talking about physical experiments, about national security issues, cryptography, yeah. communication, computing, etc. Yeah. But there's a whole universe and these are very, very serious physicists mm -hmm. who genuinely believe that there is a multiverse, mm -hmm. that we all have avatars, that this is only one avatar of us, mm -hmm. that every dis you decided to marry uh, your husband, but there's an... The, that was a quantum fork mm. in which another version of you did not marry him and you walked down. I think another version of his thinking about Aditi Rao Hedari already. <laughs> so yeah, so that is a possibility. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, yes. but they're very, very serious people, yes. uh, serious physicists mm. who genuinely believe the multiverse is real. 
avatars are real. David Deutsch, again, you know, there are all these fathers of these technologies, yeah. but the father of quantum AI says that very quickly, you know, or, or in the near future, mm. we could upload ourselves into quantum computers and see what all our avatars are doing in different mm -hmm. worlds. Mm -hmm. And they all say that the real, you know, which comes to Vedantic thought, that none of this is real. So right. now tell us, does the multiverse exist? Why is it something that very, very serious scientists are taking uh, as... So just, you know, this, this is one of those things. Um, so I actually am an experimentalist. I work in the lab and I, I measure things. I know what I'm doing. So I'm a very practical kind of person. So uh, the multiverse is something... I mean, so all the names you took, these are all very well-known theorists. Okay. So there is a group of well-known theorists who do believe that, you know, this possibility can exist and they have come up with different notions in that. One thing you may have realized because you've been, you know, doing a lot of, uh, you know, I think you, you, you know as much as I do in at least the how to explain things. Huh? Um, she does a better job. Uh, so uh, there is no experiment. There is not a single experiment which has been done to actually prove the multiverse. Neither is there an experimental proposal on how you can do that. So, you know, um, this is one of those notions which uh, is, is, it sounds very good, but then as a practical, you know, physicist, I uh, cannot just go and say that, you know, I believe in it, because I only believe in things that I know, I can measure, and I can verify. And, you know, that is, uh, I'm a very boring uh, person. But of course, you know, Hollywood wouldn't uh, use quantum as much as it does if these notions did not exist, right? right? So, and one more thing I just want to add that, you know, that's my personal belief. But having said that, you know, there's always a possibility that, you know, we don't, we don't really know uh, everything, right? Very few things we actually know. So there's always a possibility that it is in that realm. But then, you know, in my, uh, I'm not a believer of, of this notion. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, we're running three minutes late. It's time for cocktails and snacks. Oh, but wonderful, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, I'm just going to, while I'm quickly, I'm going to call out one or two questions. Do you want me to or do you want to break for drinks? Please raise your hands. <laughs> questions, okay. So I'm going to ask you to just respond. Oh, there are questions. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, yeah. From, I'm, I'm thrilled, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, Urvishi, you said to, there's a quantum paradox to what you just said. You said mm -hmm. you're an experimenter, you're a researcher, mm -hmm. and you only believe what you can measure. Mm -hmm. But the very quantum, the very phenomenon of quantum physics yeah. is that it cannot be measured. It loses its quantumness when you measure it. That's true. So that is why this entire speculative world mm -hmm. is the very heart of quantumness. You true. Know? So, See the th and your yeah. experiment proved that there is no real there is nothing. There is real. nothing called realism. Yeah. yeah. So now There's please address realism. the audience on so that. So of course, yeah, this is a very important question actually. So you know, the quantumness exists, uh, you know, as as the system evolves. But when you measure, it becomes very very classical. So all these things we talked about, these infinite possibilities of zeros and ones. When you measure, it's either a zero or a one. Okay. So this is very important to note that you know the measurement actually collapses the wave function. That is the, the, the technical way of saying this. So as you measure, you actually uh, can actually measure something which is classical. So the whole quantum mystique or whatever you want to call it, I don't call it that. You know, the, 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 because I'm a quantum physicist, I become mysterious and <laughs> I, I really am not. So then uh, the whole thing exists till you measure. And so measurement actually collapses the wave function and, and, and makes it all um, classical. So, you know, some of these questions were actually for Karthik, so I'm going to stop here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, uh, let's have uh, cocktails, cocktails and snacks yeah. and reconvene for a, a session on human creativity. This was on human ingenuity at its most cutting edge. And I hope that Urvishi will be there for us to literally, uh, you know, uh, weigh in, like sweep into her and ask about the mystery of this, that how can you deny uh, that there is no other reality when just by measuring it, we are forcing ourselves back into only what we can see. Uh, she told me not to ask about Vedantic thought, but I think it's fascinating that there was this idea that all that we see is an illusion. It was a philosophical thought and quantum physics is kind of saying, yes, that's true, but we are too shy to say it. So on that no, note... No, I think that is where, you know, this age thing that you brought in in the way, very embarrassingly I think that is playing against me, actually. <laughs> I just have to grow slightly older to appreciate these things, you know. I just don't seem to have time to 
think much. Yeah? Right. So I think that is where I am. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> right. Thank you very, very much, uh, Urvashi.